Hey everyone, it is I, Keith Garcia, Artistic Director of the C Film Center and founder of Cinema Q Film Festival. Thank you so much for uh, watching films during Cinema Q. Uh, in particular, the film you just finished, Shit and Champagne. Uh, I hope you are uh, just picking yourself up off the floor from laughing. Uh, or maybe you just passed out from something. I don't know what in the middle of the movie. But get up back on your couch because uh, we've got a special guest here uh, to do a quick Q&A with. And that is the writer, director, star, accountant, caterer, <laughs> and everything else of Shit and Champagne. That is Darcy Drollinger. Hello. Well, hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us in this virtual landscape. Wish we could be in person, yes. but we'll save that for a special occasion. Absolutely. <laughs> Super special occasion. So um, let's get down to shit and champagne. Uh, you know, based on the best selling novel by Sapphire. Um, <laughs> tell us how this, how this came to be. I know it started as a, as a, uh, off, 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 Broadway on in the street, Broadway uh, <laughs> production in the, in the gutter, in the gutter. Exactly. Tell us how this was born, and tell us how Champagne Horowitz Jones Dickinson White was born. Well, you know, she, she I had just worked on a, a really intense show out in Los Angeles uh, as part of the um, LA Film Festival, and I was just burnt. And I came back to New York where I was living at the time, and I was like, I just want to write something just ridiculous and fun and, and not not think about all the other producers and everything else and just really do something that was um, just for kicks and, and something that was a more of a vehicle for me rather than writing for other people. And so I... Um, I sat down to start it, and I, you know, I was a huge fan of Charlie's Angels and uh, the Bionic Woman and Wonder Woman and all those '70s TV ladies, but also really inspired by Pam Greer and those early um, black exploitation exploitation films. Um, also, Linda Blair, Savage Streets, and things like that. But but really looked at um, Foxy Brown as sort of a model of of the of the concept that I wanted to play with, and um, I just started writing it and. And it, it just kind of poured out. It, the only thing that I was not sure about was, you know, in those films, it's usually, you know, an everyday person who gets, you know, caught up in um, the midst of like a drug ring, right? And and then their family members and loved ones get killed and they have to, you know, take vigilante justice into their own hands. But oftentimes they get the people addicted to heroin and then enlist them into a prostitution ring. That's sort of how it goes. But I thought it's really a little challenging to make a comedy about heroin addiction. So I was reading in the Village Voice and Michael Mosto had a column about all the nightclubs uh, plumbing problems because everyone was doing booty bumps shooting crystal meth up their butt and then shitting their pants and having to flush their underwear down the toilets and then everything was overflowing. I thought, well, this is a much, much more comical drug addiction to have. <laughs> so that's sort of how that was born. Thank you, Michael. And um, so it, it was it was born out of the pages of the newspaper. So I didn't make it up. And um and then no one would no one would produce the show. Um, even I've tried to get it produced in a number of different theaters and a number all across the country, and no one would produce it because I think the name, but also if you looked at it on paper, it looked like a twelve year old boy had written, a, <laughs> you know, a, a show about poop jokes, and uh, I, you know, so I was like, I'm going to produce it myself, and so I we put it up in um, a strip club uh, in Lower East Side in Manhattan. And we would do the show before the um, real entertainment started at 10. <laughs> and it was a perfect place for it. It ran for nine months. Um, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And I look back at the old footage and it's real rough. You know, I think we had our, our dimmer switch was just four dimmers. We took a pencil to turn the lights up, turn the lights down. So. <laughs> That's sort of how th that happened. And then when I moved to San Francisco, we did the show and it really, um, we mounted it in 2014. It got a ton of traction. People started coming over and over and over. 
Um, they called themselves the shitheads. They would chant alliance lines with us. It was very Rocky Horror esque. And then when I opened my nightclub, it was the very first show we did there, and it ran. It ran for a really long time. So that's a little bit of, of the history in a nutshell. That's a that's a good sorted past. <laughs> that's a, <laughs> this scale to start. And um, um, yeah, and she's been married a couple of times. So yeah, just can. a couple. <laughs> um, Tell us where uh, Darcy ends and Champagne begins. Like, where's the, how, how close do you feel to this character? Um, I mean, you know, I've lived with her for a lot of years now. So I, I really do know her. Um, you know, she does all the things that I can't do in my everyday life in a way in, in terms of, um, her audacity and her brazen charm. I, I Someone recently watched the film and said it was like watching a real live Miss Piggy. And <laughs> <laughs> because the emotion goes from, you know, zero to a hundred in like one second. <laughs> and, um, and I thought that was the biggest compliment. And, you know, I'm working on a sequel called Champagne White and the Temple of Poon. And um, <laughs> that one, I'm really going to, really try to embody Miss Piggy even more now that I have that as my template. <laughs> You're so. working on your, uh, your angry, like, <gasps> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and going from so sweet and lovable to like, ah, you know, I do do, I do do a high ya karate chop in, in shit and champagne, which is, you know, that was my little homage, but I hadn't really clocked, fully the scope of that they have the same emotional arc miss piggy <laughs> like glamour sex and then like intense anger man finishes exactly and beer. throw in some bad dad jokes and you got a movie <laughs> uh perfect um I was just telling uh, Whitney, describing this film, I was like, this film is far funnier than it has any right to be. So thank <laughs> I you. For... <laughs> <laughs> I, and I will, so, and, and uh, coming into this too, like I, I will admit a um, uh, ignorance to, to your career, to be honest. And, and I'm very heavily like involved at least in local drag and sort of like national drag and stuff. But, I think you're very centralized in California, yes? Which is probably yes. where you are. You are top of the game, I imagine, in California. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted to, I guess, meet you this way. To kind of meet you first as Champagne. And then I did definitely be like, well, what else has Darcy done that I have missed in all this time? And um, obviously some great live stuff. Like uh, you had some great stretches uh, in a live Golden Girls production. Mm -hmm. uh, that I imagine seemed very popular. Uh, it was Rose Nyland always your role that you took on in that in that production. She is. Um, you know, I share the same birth date with Betty White, so <laughs> she's sort of she's my other spirit animal. Well, I do Samantha Jones as well in Sex and the City Live, um, which is polar opposites. But you know, <laughs> um, yes, Betty White has always been the role, um, and she's a challenging one because there's a lot of nuance in that comedy, and it's, it's and you know it can get a little heavy handed at times. But um, yeah, I'm a I'm a big fan. That 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 show has been great. The my my fellow queens in that show are all fantastic, and we have quite a. Uh, you know, a real life little family there. We do it every Christmas and it, uh, it packs it in. We're even uh, done some tours. Maybe someday we'll come out to see you, but it's, it's been a, it's been really fun because people just love that show. And I've worked really hard to recreate the set as close as I can to the real set. And we, we try the episodes we're parodying. We, we work really hard to get most of the costumes and everything on point. I get a little OCD on things like that. But, so. You know, the devil's in the details. But it's, it's true. It's true. It matters. And I mean, to, to uh, Chip and Champagne's credit as well, it looks, <laughs> I was going to say, it looks like a thousand bucks. <laughs> uh, but on 
on the good end of a thousand bucks. Like, you know, I, I've, I've watched many, 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 uh, you know, low budget uh, drag comedy where it's like, you know, you're not going for, not going for that Oscar, but, right. <laughs> you know, and, 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 but your, your sets, everything like that look, I, I guess it, it, maybe this is hard to explain. Great, but also like they should look for an exploitation parody, which is not very high budget, right? But not so low budget that it's made of paper. Um, <laughs> it so. was a it was a challenge to kind of get that balance, you know. And I and it looked really. I mean, I I'm really proud of the film. It was a ton of work, but I also was lucky enough to get some really talented cinematographers and um, lighting people and and, uh, production folks to work on those sets. Um, The the irony is, you know, a lot of them would do commercial work and they wanted to get, you know, have some feature work under their belts. And so I got these people that are really top of their game, but the the challenge was trying to explain to them that I want this to look bad sometimes when all they do is try to make things look perfect, you know? And uh, it was, but marrying the two, I think we were able to do what, just what you said was, were to create something that really harkened back to those exploitation films, but had that saturated color and that, you know, that, that slight, that, sort of you know brighter sparkle that that does feel make it feel also a little current you know so it was that it was that the, the marrying of the two um but yeah it's uh it was um you know a lot of people say it's hard to take something from the stage and turn it into a film and i i think you know because i've often in my my drag career uh staged film and tv show parodies so i was i knew how to work backwards so when writing this even for stage i was writing it with all the foley sounds and everything in there so it was almost it was parodying cinema on stage so transferring it back to cinema um, while it was, there were challenges and some things just didn't translate and, and are on the cutting room floor, there's going to be a great director's cut. We were able to make something that I feel like, uh, you know, it didn't feel like we were trying to uh, film a stage production, but it feels authentically like, like cinema. And yeah, and I love that so much about this. I, I'm a big fan of spoofs and and movies that also do that. You know, from Airplane and you know the old. Oh, uh, I love Airplane. You know, there's a Pat Proft and all that stuff, and that's I think that's perhaps what I kind of kept feeling throughout this, where you know there were honest to goodness lines and things that just made me cackle, which is hard to do. <laughs> Yay! Um, uh, I have begun adding. Uh, <laughs> Whenever, whenever anyone, anyone, a stranger asks me, like, "Oh, what do you want?" Like, I, you know, go and order a bagel or something. What do you want? Sometimes, if I'm feeling, I just say, "Justice." Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, <laughs> and a little stinger to my everyday conversation. Um, I love but, that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you work with, uh, like you said, is some of your. Um, your your drag your performance family uh, from Golden Girls like Alaska Thunderfuck is in this. Yes, um, love Alaska, just salt of the earth, just such a great person. <laughs> and um, oh, I should, Matthew you know, Martin, I Matthew Martin Absolutely. as well, who is just you know a genius performer, and I think you know, sort of playing that villain was a little out out of <laughs> Matthew's scope, um, you know, and we had such a, such a great time. I mean, he is, he is, I mean, I remember watching Matthew when I was just a little baby queen, uh, you know, on stage mm-hmm. and, and so in awe of how he was able to hold, hold the space and could just look at the audience and make them fall apart, you know, and I think, I think 
he he gets uh, really gets what I do in that in that sense where it is you know live on stage we do, well, I like to call it vaudeville 2.0 where there's really this sort of it is taking a lot of what the old vaudeville was and and sort of reimagining it in the now time uh, and I think you know that those are big inspirations to me like Mel Brooks and the Zucker Brothers the airplane movies and and you can and I feel like because I've worked with this cast, Stephen LeMay, Nancy French, James Arthur, Matthew, they all get it. So we're able to, you know, there are those moments and, you know, B. Arthur said it actually in an interview that was how, how comedy, good comedy, that kind of comedy is dangerous because it is one of those things where you do something for a long time. It's that slow burn. It is brandy falling over and over on the beach where three times is, is funny. Then the fourth time, maybe they're not laughing so much and it's scary. But if you push it for a fifth or a sixth, <laughs> then they fall apart. But it's scary because you're like, you're on the edge there for the, for the laughs. And it, that's the interesting part in film where it's like, you don't have that audience. So you know, of course, there's a little bit of anxiety around me of people like watching this at, you know, in their in their pajamas at home versus, you know, being drunk in a, a nightclub and watching it. So, um, you know, I, well, I think it's event, it's an event driven movie. And I think there's lots of fun ways I mean, I, they could have drinking games and all those kinds of things to do at home there. I do want it to be funny enough that you can Netflix and chill with it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping personally to, you know, when our theater, we, we operate a year round theater uh, is open next year that, uh, you know, perhaps we can take a stab at a, at a shit and champagne uh, late night. Uh, do and, that. Maybe we can come we out can and do a pre-show. We can come out and do a pre-show. I would absolutely love that. That's, you know, we're an odd year or year so who, you know, who knew that 2021 would be 2020, the director's cut, but, uh, <laughs> exactly. but that, exactly. you know, like that, that's the thing is I, I love that your film exists. It's getting an opportunity to get out there and then we'll take it to an even bigger place. Yes. Uh, here and, uh, and just in time for for the Temple of Poon. <laughs> <laughs> that one's gonna be real funny. That one's gonna be real funny. Well, uh, it's got a it's got a huge challenge to top uh, how funny this is, which I'm sure you are <laughs> up for the task. Um, anything? Uh, what, what's next for you, other than obviously trying to get uh, Temple of Poon off the ground? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, that is that is my my next my next big uh, big cinematic push. I mean, right now here in San Francisco, we just got the club reopened. Um, we're going to do an immersive Rocky Horror um, live show where I'm going to play Frank, and that, I think that's going to be real fun in October. And then Golden Girls in December, and then next early next year as well. We'll see if I finish my script, but we'll, I'd love to start working on the, on the new, uh, on the new champagne. I do have a other real fun project that I'm trying to get off the ground. I really want to do a drag, um, a nighttime soap opera. I'm hoping that I can get that picked up called bitch slap, um, which is a <laughs> dynasty inspired, um, uh, based on a show that I that I had written uh, in 2017, but I think that would be a really fun um, uh, episodic adventure. So, you know, we'll see which of those two um, gets the most traction. But um, those are those are my two um, film projects that I'm working on. Well, that's nothing short of exciting. I love it. I'm uh, so excited to see the continued adventures of Champagne. And you and just everything. Um, very excited by your talent, and thanks for sharing that with me. Well, thank you for having me. And um, if you're ever in San Francisco, come be my guest at the at the club, Oasis. I will ring you up. I'll knock on your window. <laughs> okay, and good. Then <laughs> throw a brick through it. Fabulous. Uh, <laughs> well, viewers, uh, thank you for watching uh, Shouldn't Champagne. Uh, this is the creator extraordinaire of that tale and so many others, Darcy Drollinger. Thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, so we'll see you at the next Cinema Q film. Thanks, everyone. Bye.